So my name is Daniel Garcia, and today we're going to be talking about turning waste streams into revenue streams, all while repairing our environment. Oh, can we turn that up a little bit? The other one? That back one over there. Lights can't match. There we go. There we go. Okay. We all good? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. Okay, you're on. <laughs> so the the key points for today that we like to take away from all this is that with biochar we can reduce air pollution, reduce water contamination, increase soil fertility and drought tolerance, all while creating economic gain, especially for farmers. So what is biochar? Myochar is charcoal that's destined for the soil. So most people are familiar with the charcoal that's destined for their grill. That can potentially carry some accelerants, uh, which is toxic, uh, toxic chemicals for biology. So we don't want to put that in soil. And then the other end of the spectrum is, say, uh, activated charcoal or activated carbon, which we're familiar with our water filters or our air filters. Basically, biochar, again, is meant for the soil, and that's why, why we're calling it biochar is because we're charging it with biology. Um, so it's a recalcitrant form of carbon. What's recalcitrant mean? Recalcitrant just means that it does not break down easily, so it lasts for hundreds to thousands of years in the soil, which is a double whammy with the sequestered carbon. I hope everyone, well, maybe not everyone's familiar with sequestered. So sequestered just means to hide something away. It's something a lot of environmentalists are talking about now. We have a lot of emissions, these greenhouse gases in overabundance, and we're trying to hide them or sequester them into the soil. So the great thing about biochar is that we can sequester this carbon because it's recalcitrant for thousands of years in the, in the, in the ground. So we can drastically reduce our carbon footprint. It's highly adsorbent. So everyone's familiar with a sponge, absorbent, right? So imagine if that was a sponge, if we put water on it, all those, it, basically the water would be absorbed and it would become one with that sponge. You couldn't tell the difference between the water and the sponge, they'd be one. But biochar is a little different, it's adsorbent, so it adds things onto its surface. And so all of this structure here that you see, all that surface area, is, it potentially is it's ready to adsorb. And that surface area, one gram of biochar is equivalent to two tennis courts in terms of surface area. So tremendous amounts of capacity in terms, in terms of ad, 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 adsorbability. Charged with biology and foods. Um, there's multiple ways to do this, but today we'll be mostly talking about using dairy runoff because it's a great waste and a lot of farmers have it available. Uh, and so we see these molecules sticking to the surfaces that gives us an idea of how they behave. They don't become one with, again, they're sticking on the surface, and that's what happens when we charge with, no, actually, let me just clarify charge. So charge, basically, when, we turn, when we're talking about biochar, we're just basically talking about if it's charged, we put biology and foods on the surface area. If it's uncharged, then it's just that open pore structure. It's like a skeleton ready for, for additions, right? Um, and microbial habitat. So everyone's familiar with, well, you know what, let's, let's go in the ocean for a moment and let's imagine a coral reef, a healthy coral reef. So in a healthy coral reef, we will have uh, shelter, what, food, water, all the animals, and they, have, they breathe oxygen out of that water too. So they have a habitat that everything they need to survive. That's what biochar does in the soil. Basic principles, super important make the best char possible. We're not gonna go and cut down the rainforest to make biochar. We're gonna try to use waste. Uh, another way to tell that we've made some of the best char possible, it's gotta be 100% black. If there's any brown spots on it, we're not gonna get, um, we're, gonna, we're limiting our pore space, which means we're limiting the function, uh, functionability of this char. To get the maximum benefits, we need it to be fully blackened. Uh, a great kind of indicator that you've got some quality stuff is if you drop it on itself, it will actually give you like a glass-like sound. It's really beautiful. Um, and then finally is that we want little to no ash content because if there's ash, that means that there's oxidation happening. If there's oxidation happening, that means greenhouse gases were emitted rather than sequestered. And if also on top of that, if we're trying, if, we, if it's ash, it's, if it's gassing off, that's less end product, that's less money. That's not good, right? Um, oh. 
The yeah. second bullet point uses as much process energy as possible. Yes. Did, did you explain process energy? No, I'm getting to that right now. So, um, so what what that means is that when we're producing biochar, tremendous amounts of heat is produced. Well. They've found several methods to get use that heat to either heat ground greenhouses, create electricity, and so many other things that I would be here for hours talking about it. But yes, it, the cool thing is that when we create this, we're not wasting anything. The additional heat can be used for even more purposes, creating more revenue streams, which is awesome. Eliminate as much emissions as possible. We'll, talk, we'll be talking today about two methods which reduce emissions while creating really beautiful shark and that's super uh, super important to you and then of course we got to make it profitable if it's not profitable we can't get farmers and everyone else on board so how is biochar made biochar made is made as you can see here we have a double barrel uh setup where we have a smaller barrel within a bigger barrel and uh see if i can get this fancy little doodad working okay cool so we have a barrel within a barrel and you have these main air intakes applied here, here, and then as well additional air intakes here. And what happens is the air flows from below up and out. And the cool thing about this is when you use this method, well, first of all, we're filling the barrels with organics, right? We're filling with wood, didn't, didn't clarify that. So we fill with wood. Once we filled with wood, we light the fire on top. And as you can see here, the fire burns down. And what ends up happening is the inner barrel known as a retort starts baking like an oven. Um, as this retort bakes, it, all the volatile gases, the, the vapors and compounds, they start being pressurized and released out the bottom holes, which are now funneled up the sides of the inner barrel, which then meet the flame front. So those gases normally would be smoke, which would just go up in the air. But now instead, we're burning it super clean, getting practically no smoke, and ending with the residual product that's worth a bunch of money and has great um, properties. Conservation ag burn. So we're all familiar with the ag around here having giant piles of waste and occasionally burning that waste. Well, this is the conventional method, right? We light a fire from the bottom. We burn all of this material. And we end up with 100% pollution where the University of California, the Cooperative Extension, Sonoma County, they found that if we burn from the top down, what ends up happening is kind of the same thing we saw with that barrel. The, the biomass below the fire is releasing gases, releasing water, and it's going directly into that fire, which is above it, and burning off super clean. So you can see, where's the smoke? Reduced by up to 85%. Uh, so after a certain point, we'll get to uh, having a, a certain amount of ash is starting to form, and we're like, hey, we don't want it to oxidize too much. So we wake down, and we look at our pile of money. <laughs> so uh, they actually went above and beyond. They took this, this pile of money, this biochar, and they grew some corn with it. So you can see uh, without, without the biochar, we have smaller corn, and with the biochar, we have like 33% increase in size. It's huge. Okay, so this top-down burn is your biochar method. Right? Yes. Um, and the previous slide, you had the two, the container within a container yes. method. How are they similar? So, well, they're similar in a sense to where they are burning those gases and reducing smoke emissions. But the, the first uh, container, it actually is going to create more biomass. So you're going to have more biochar as an end product. You end up with about a 50% return in biomass, where with this process, you end up with 1 15th of the, but the great thing about this is this is free. So farmers can get on board with this right now, not spend an extra dime, they don't have to do anything extra. They can do this now and reduce emissions dramatically. Um, and I'd like to, we'll talk to that, about that a little bit more at the end. But yeah, so we can see the difference. It's things and are, growing. are you going to talk about uh, air, air quality issues? Yeah, totally. Okay. So, in this uh, dairy runoff publication, they mentioned that the manure technology feasibility assessment panel instituted by the California Air Resources Board compared 44 different manure man management technologies. Many were not suitable for liquid manure, which is the most common waste product from dairy farms in California. Out of the 44 compared, very few could remove salts 
or phosphorus. Systems which can reduce phosphorus in wastewater can cost up to $600 per cow for construction with an average herd size of 824 in California, it would cost farmers roughly a half a million dollars. So that's why we're not seeing them re reducing these wastes. Where if we use biochar, which we just talked about could be produced for free. We have 80 million tons of waste biomass in California produced every year. That can, according to the map in the publication, can be, trans, uh, can be converted to 20 million tons of biochar. And we also have 1.8 million milk cows approximately with a whole lot of dairy flush manure. So we take the dairy flush manure, apply it to the biochar, and we end up capturing 57,200 tons of ammonia and 4,600 tons of phosphate. Talk about savings for farmers, because that's, for that's fertilizer right there. It's great stuff. Uh, so how much are we saving farmers? 9.2 million, 9 million in nitrogen and 0.9 million in phosphate fertilizer. Another thing that's not mentioned in this, uh, well actually they mentioned this in the publication is that when they did these calculations, they didn't test for organic nitrogen, only ammonia. So in, the, in uh, another study, they found that the majority of nitrogen in manure is in the form of organic nitrogen and ammonia. So this $9.2 million in savings for farmers is likely way higher. See you. Groundwater pollution caused by dairy wastewater is now a major environmental and health concern. The University of California conducted an extensive review of groundwater pollution over four counties, including Tulare County. The study reported groundwater with nitrate levels exceeding maximum safe levels multiple times in the past. This was done in 2012. They also mention in the study that it's only getting worse. So, and another thing is here in Visalia, we run on groundwater. So we're dealing with unsafe levels of nitrates in our groundwater. Well, what we found though is that with biochar, we can absorb 65% of ammonium, uh, a, a form of nitrogen, and 43% of phosphate in 24 hours. So this stuff's fast acting, and again, we can produce it for free or cheap. Oh shoot, skipped ahead, I'm sorry. So, biochar is United Nations approved, but let me drop this first. The United Nations, Conven uh, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification and other organizations have supported biochar applications as a sustainable land management strategy for different types of soil and production systems around the world. United Nations approved. <laughs> okay, so, um, also in this dairy runoff publication, they did a little bit of, of using that biochar, right? They had a almond orchard, it was very sandy soil, and so they took some of the biochar that they made, it was just plain biochar that was uncharged, so the pore surface area had nothing on it. And they laid that out in, in their almond field, and then they took some charged uh, biochar with the dairy manure, they laid that out in a separate area, and they measured the soil because most people don't know this, but soil re releases greenhouse gases too. So they measured the greenhouse gases coming off their sandy soil and off of both the soil, uh, the both applications of biochar, charged and uncharged. And what they found is that when you put the charcoal on the soil, it reduces emissions from the soil by 400% approximately, whether it's charged or uncharged, which is really cool because not every farmer has that capacity to charge, but most of them have the capacity to make biochar. So we're talking about reduction in emissions via the air. She probably uses biochar in her garden. <laughs> this field experiment was established in a vineyard at the Nebraska State, located a few kilometers away from central Italy. A randomized plot experiment uh, was set up in 2009. The treatments were a single biochar application at a rate of 22 tons per hectare. A hectare is basically two and a half, two and a half acres. And so the single biochar application, again, at 22 tons per hectare, is signified by B, or the gray columns. And, sorry, I'm not the greatest, greatest pointer. Uh, and so there's a double application of 22 tons per hectare. Uh, so once in 2009, once in 2010, and that's sim symbolized by BB, or the maroon. And then the control is, is black. So biochar was applied in the inner row space of the vineyard using a spreader and was incorporated in the soil using a chisel plow tiller to the depth of 0.3 meters. 
what they found is that, as we can see here, this is the volumetric water in the soil throughout the year, different times of the year. Sorry, I'm going away. Um, so you can see that water significantly increased in the soil the more biochar that was applied. Another great side effect of this, and this is really important too for the summer months, because we're talking about droughts, right, in, in our area. Um, so what, one thing that uh, is mentioned in this article is that stomatal conductance is increased in, uh, it was significantly higher in the B and BB applications in comparison to the control in both July and August. What's the model conductance? Well, this, the, every, all the plants have little stomata, these pores on the bottom of their leaves. And those release water vapor, they absorb carbon dioxide, and they take part in photosynthesis. If the model conductance goes down or shuts down, photosynthesis shuts down. If we have elevated stomatal conductance, we have elevated photosynthesis, which would make sense to why we have bigger corn on that one image, right? Um, which is great for farmers again because we're growing bigger, healthier crops. Like, wouldn't it suck to be in July and August with all this sun and photosynthesis shuts down? So, uh, another thing that biochar does is whenever when it's applied to the soil, bulk density of that soil decreases. What does that mean? That means less compaction, more airflow, more water flow. The, the roots are able to grow better. It's just a better condition for plants. So it's awesome. Um, so when viewed in a more operational perspective, the results of this experiment suggest that biochar applications could increase the resilience to drought, thus promoting biochar as a climate change adaption strategy that could be adopted by farmers. So key takeaway points, we're going to have cleaner air, cleaner water, drought resilience, which is awesome again, uh, higher fertility, and most importantly, we could make money, right? So call to action, we'd like to see Peter Hurst come, whether it's for his Earth Day or maybe another another event, but we really, it'd be highly advantageous to bring Peter Hurst. He's been a guest speaker at all the domestic conferences of biochar since 2009. He's a leading expert, and when you were asking earlier about those uh, the difference between the methods, the he, this guy builds giant systems for farms and all, he's, He's the master, so it'd be amazing to bring him. And he has Tulare County connections. He does. He has his family, and we had him speak at our uh, climate solutions study group, so I'll just second that. He was an excellent presenter. Yes. It's cooperation. Everyone here has a beautiful individual perspective, and when we combine our perspectives, especially with the knowledge that we have here today, we can really make significant change. So cooperation is key, and whatever we can do to work together to make this stuff happen, I'm all about it. And so a mobile biochar system for our county. The conservation burn is the first step. It's cheap, farmers can do it now, and we can get, we can get the pollution lessened, we can get the biochar created, we can, we can take that step. But again, it returns 1 15th of the biomass. So you're not getting as much money residual product that you could be getting. Or if we created a mobile biochar system for our county, which Peter Hurst is an expert at, we now would be able to, say, lend farmers out right, for a designated period of time. They make their char, they increase, they, they have now 50% return in product, and we're actually, the mobile uh, system is, is gonna reduce pollution even further. So, thank you guys. That's, that concludes my, my uh, presentation. Do you know, uh,